how this began is I have a personal interest in yokai. I just like them. And the more I went through and learned about them, the more and more they revealed themselves to be in proximity to our Māori iwi ātua, which is our spirits and our gods, also our monsters, much like the yokai and the kami, who hew closer to the gods of the Japanese people. This is me standing next to a robot, and this is me standing next to the Tower of the Sun at the Osaka Expo 70 grounds. Uh, my lovely wife is pictured in the corner. She sits also in the front. And we've been to Japan now three times. Yeah. So including the time I went when I was 12 years old, that makes it about four times. So we try to get there as often as we can. Speaking about the previous work I've done as a critic, um, I think maybe the, the biggest work that I undertook with my colleague Sophie Wilson was a project on Aotearoa Futurism, which is expressions of futurism and science fiction coming from Māori and Pacific Island artists, writers and thinkers in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, I picked these two particular works for the reason that they express a close Japanese connection. First of all, the localization of Sailor Moon here characterizes Sela Marama, Marama being the moon. Uh, the next is a record which uh, oddly sits in the corner of this very room in the record collection, if anyone would like to look afterwards. But here we have a waka rendered as a spaceship in a silvery chrome. The art style is drawn from Hajime Sorayama, the great airbrush artist of Japan. The second most popular thing I've ever written <laughs> was about these dancing kiwi fruit. Uh, earlier in this year, 2022, um, our Prime Minister had caused to visit Japan on a diplomatic trade embassy trip, uh, where she was treated to classical Japanese music and the presence of these two large fluffy kiwi fruit. Uh, this puzzled a lot of people, to be honest. They thought it was quite an odd image to see. Um, not odd at all. I think it's a really nice meeting of cultures where the classical Japanese shakuhachi was played, along with the Western violin, and then the presentation of a uniquely Japanese manifest manifestation of the anthropomorphic, which is their mascots, or yurukara. So what we'll expand upon as we go through this talk are the connections that we can see between the peoples of the Pacific and the peoples of Japan, who are also peoples of the Pacific. The Pacific Ocean is such that it covers one third of the entire planet's surface. It's roughly equivalent to all of the land available on this planet. You could fit every mountain, every forest, <laughs> every desert, every plains, every tundra inside of the surface area of the Pacific Ocean. It then runs immeasurably deep. Amongst this, within this environment, we have a range of different peoples. Clearly, for such a large area, we run around Southeast Asia, all along to East Asia, coming back around through to North America, South America, all the way down to Argentina. A massive land, a uh, innumerable amount of people, but with similarities. The way that we draw out these similarities is by seeing, seeing the connections made between the mediating culture of peoples and their environment. These connections generally find expression within these fields. Arts and representation, this would be Homo Faba at work, uh, creations of drawings, illustrations, carvings, weavings, so on. Protocols and practices, which would be the laws developed by those people, or ways of being, rules, norms, and the means of undertaking activities. 
The third would be narratives and knowledge. Um, perhaps the broadest of the categories, it being intangible. This is how people generate their knowing of the world and how they hold information as well as communicating it to themselves and to others, and indeed back to the environment itself. So I thought we might start at ground one here. <laughs> here we have the flag of Japan, a uh, beautiful flag, one of the best flags in the world. Tinoranga Tiratanga sits next to it as equal. <laughs> um, part of that is the fact that they express very similar things. In the center, we have a red disc. This is the sun. Japan, of course, in the Japanese language is Nihon, meaning closely the origin of the sun. The nation of Japan itself is founded by the goddess Amaterasu, the sun goddess. And then later, the people formed by the princess Himiko, also a shaman of the sun. Floating in this empty space here, we call Ma. Now that's not Māori Ma, it just happens to be. Ma in Māori is white. In, Je in the history of Japanese aesthetics, Ma can be the, the blank space what in English we would call the negative space. Not so negative in this conception. It shoots closer to te kore or te pō. Here's a graphical representation of the ring of fire that I mentioned earlier. Again, the Pacific, one third of the earth, and all of it alive, alive at the edges. And a little bit towards the top there, you can see two explosions in the middle. That's Hawaii. What's represented by this ring of fire is an immense force created by the shifting of tectonic plates. This means earthquakes, and it means volcanoes, and it means geothermal activities. It also can mean rich ashes feeding crops. It can also mean large tides and migrations, warmth. It's a once gives us resources and presents us challenges at the same time. And really, if we look at, if you think about the distance between, say, the Philippines and California, you can go from Australia right down to Argentina, a massive distance. So focusing then on these geothermal and tectonic activities, the fire of the Ring of Fire, uh, we'll begin to look at the mountains and how they form the way, rather how the cultures interact with that environment of mountainous. Put the slide out of order. <laughs> this is a much more basic representation of similarities between Maori and Japanese, being language, first of all. So on the top line, we have the Maori alphabet, which is alliteration of our word sounds. We have ahaka mana para tawangafa, eheke men epe, and so on. It's monophong. It's called a monophong, uh, which is a very complicated word for a very simple mouth sound. Switching now to the Japanese language, we have hiragana, which is one of the alphabets of Japan. We have here, akasa tana hamayarawa. Back again, ahakamana para tawagafa. Back again, akasa tana hamayarawa. Hopefully this is enough to show just how there's a, an almost immediate connection there. Um, and we can hold on to that. That's it's no mistake that these two languages should find themselves both struck through by the ring of this fire. Uh, professional linguists have been studying. It's it's known what this connection is is a genealogy of languages. Um, I'm not an expert in that field, so I can't tell you it specifically. 
but it exists as a connection. Seen again how closely these languages work together, we can go from the English alliteration to katakana, which is the Japanese alphabet for foreign words, we could call it that, and then back into English to see how it matches. So we have in the top left, New Zealand, which becomes New Zealando, which is a nice phonetic fit, that's not bad. Everyone can know what New Zealando means. But if we go to Aotearoa, in the middle we have Aotearoa, and when we come out again, we have Aotearoa. <laughs> um, not everything matches this perfectly, but a lot of it does. A set example, Mount Albert, Mount Alberto, quite close. But once more, Owairaka, Owairaka, Owairaka. So we don't speak the same languages, but we speak the same sound, and we can understand the sound immediately. Here's some other <laughs> claps from the crowd. We will love a kaimoana. Here we see uh, linguistic similarities at the level of word. Ika for squid in Japanese, Ika for fish in general in Māori. Or the kina for us Māori for the Japanese uni. So many, so many of these continue. Uh, our eel is tuna, which everyone will know as the tuna fish. Uh, in Japanese, unagi. The more you go on, the more similar they sound. That's a good place to look at the ocean and how important it is to both peoples. Not strictly oceanic. Um, what we have here is a very, very large catfish or namazu. Or namazu. This is the deity or yokai responsible for earthquakes in Japan, a region that experiences just about as much seismic activity as anywhere else on the planet. We can see here um, a crowd scene. I believe this is from the latter Edo period, so it's quite modern in relation to the long history of this legendary yokai. Um, and they're beating him up because he won't do what they need him to do which is continued to provide. Large fish from the ocean, land, needs to do what it's told. This is our ancestor Maui, fishing up the North Island, Te Ika o Maui. The fish of the land that we stand on right now. Yeah, Maui's long line can be seen pulling at the po of the house rather the tickle tickle at the very top while his brothers lay in the boat and he's lifting the land up from the ocean if there's two if there's a group of people who know that the land comes from the ocean it's everyone in the pacific because we've seen it volcanic activity earthquakes the shifting of tectonic plates have been have been viewed rising from the sea just as early as 2020, you could go back and look at uh, video footage from Hawaii while one of their monga had erupted and new land is being formed in front of your eyes. Uh, this is an odd experience globally because it's only really the people within that ring of fire who have that kind of first eye knowledge. Um, in Europe in the Middle Ages, medieval times, it was considered a heresy to suggest that mountains had not always been present or that they would change. This is quite different from the living view of the ocean shared between the Japanese people, Maori people and others in the Pacific. That's a blue orb that I drew in word art. Going back closer to Yorkai, if we might, um, this is in a yokai, yokai heavy talk. But we can look at some of the relationships which are expressed through yokai and through the equivalents, which it's a struggle to translate because yokai is yokai. It's not really divisible. There's no, monsters is not a fit. 
spirits is too suggestive. Gods is too a foreigner concept to introduce. So yokai and kami, we can at least put together the spirits. In Māori, we would say iwi atua. Again, not really divisible. Gods, but not gods as such. Divine, but amongst us. And one pattern that we see in these different formulations of yokai and iwi atua is that they're parallel peoples which means for the peoples who create and tell these stories, uh, that yokai and iwiatua often have a parallel social structure, meaning that they not only live alongside us, but live like us in a slightly different way. Uh, perhaps the most pressing example for this would be from the Waikato, where my people are from. Uh, when the mist rises in the Waikato, the patu paere here come out into our world. Uh, patu paere here haven't had that much popular discourse, um, even in recent times. But they've been referred to as fairies in the past. And this isn't fairies so much as winged Disney characters. They're much closer to the Irish concept of the fae, which which are another type of a people who are amongst you in your land and have some suspicion about you. They're not to be approached. They're not necessarily bad and they're not malevolent, but it's best if some distance exists between them. The, prolifer the proliferation of yokai means that there's not as strong an, an example to be set with the Japanese. But we could look at an example like the Tengu, who's a kind of, um, you may have seen the scrolls outside. The Tengu looks like a monk with a very long nose and he has wings. Tengu are known for kidnapping people and taking them to the mountains, but also within certain legends, imparting priestly knowledges, so divine knowledges, advanced sciences, and ways of understanding um, certain craftsmen and warriors of legend have been raised by Tengu or returned to the human population after time in the mountains. This is the same with Midu of the Potupayere here. Uh, I believe this story comes from Natimani Apoto. Again, Midu is a Potupayere here. He, we have the interact. Hmm. how to phrase Midu made contact with humans and he was tricked into continuing that contact thereafter he took his human family to the mountains and imparted to them the knowledge of Fare Wanang teaching them the arts of Tohunga including astrology and games and specialized crafts In parallel to something which we might consider more of a deity rather than a civilization, uh, up the top we have beautiful carving from Clifford Whiting, I believe, of Tafiri Matia. Now, this is Atua, which would be closer to the idea of a wind god. There's not more of Tafiri Matia, it's just him. In the bottom, we have Baijin on the left and Fujin on the right. Again, distinct. They don't come in multitudes. It is they who are in charge of, on the left, lightning, and on the right, wind. I like Fujin because he's, he's carrying a sack, which he keeps the wind in, and then he squeezes it out, and the wind shoots out into our world. So while having these similar mediating cultures towards our environment and towards ourselves, we also have very similar, very direct, direct relationships with the physical environment being nature. Uh, the best example I could find of this was in 2009, an official partnership or sisterhood 
of sorts was announced between two trees in Aotearoa and in Japan near Kagoshima, I believe. Uh, the Japanese tree, the Jomon Sugi, and in Aotearoa, in the Northland, Tane Mahuta. Everyone's familiar with Tane Mahuta? Very large kauri tree to the north. Uh, the Jomon Sugi is a similarly large ancient cedar of almost 5,000 years. Here they are. Beautiful trees. Uh, apparent, that's apparent to anyone. When you stand in the presence of something so physically large, it's difficult not to have your subjectivity changed. A uh, classic example of this is people crying in front of a Rothko painting, where they can get confronted with something sublime, something overwhelming. And for both of our cultures, there has been uh, these great tonga and these living spirits, the atua, tane muhuta, the indivisible god of the forest, lives in the tree. He's present there and alive for as long as the tree is. We honor him when we visit. In the Jomon, in the Jomon Sugi, similarly, the kami lives in the tree. It's a sacred tree in and of itself. The vine, by its age, but also by its witness to history. Over 5,000 years, the tree has acquired a circumference of about 16.3 meters, which is very large, but divided by 5,000 represents a very incremental growth, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit across millennia until it reaches a size. It has a great strength. I'm not sure about the backstory of how this came to be. Uh, possibly one person had just visited the other and recognized the similarity. But the relationship was formalized between the two nations so that we would know that we have kinship between us and that on, other, and that on either side of either Aotearoa or Japan, there were people who would understand us. Again, much like the tree and the sacredness of the environment and the mutual individual respect for both, the Japanese and the Maori people have a deep appreciation for mountains. That sounds funny, right? Everyone has a relationship with the mountains. They're big, everyone can see them. Um, but again, it's the expression and the mediating culture that brings in the strongest similarities. First of all, is the idea that a mountain is an ancestor. Not just a location, but a living spirit who watches us and has watched our ancestors as they grew. The mountain provides usually water as a running source. If it's snow capped, also shade, also in, volca in volcanic areas, ash, heat, sulfurs and other useful minerals. It's hard to tell the two apart. Uh, if anyone can guess what we're looking at, one of these is Mount Fuji, referred to by the Japanese people as Fujisan, San, that that title of personhood is given personification and respect as though he were amongst us because he is. Another of these mountains is our Monga Taranaki. Again, the great ancestor to its people, the witness to the entire history of them has been there before them and continues to view them still. Just as a reveal, Fuji is on the right, Taranaki is on the left. They look so similar that they've often been used um, as replacements for each other. In the film, The Last Samurai, starring Tom Cruise, uh, was filmed in Taranaki using Mount Taranaki as a standard because it's, it, it's just a really good match. Also, the, the lush areas surrounding are very similar. I think that's what I had for that. Going back to the more real politic of international relations and black letter law, 
Taranaki has legal personhood. That was declared in 2017. So, whilst both cultures recognize towards themselves the idea that the mountain is alive and has personhood, uh, that we've managed to pass that into law in Aotearoa. Not that it was an easy feat, but it has happened. So this idea that the world is not only where we live, but is alive and an active partner in our lives and conscious is described in English as animism. Uh, I'll read out the definition for people who are on video. Animism, the attribution of a living soul to plants, inanimate objects and natural phenomena. Two, the belief in a supernatural power that organizes and animates the material universe. This is a functional definition, but there are issues in here. We can strike out ancient and we can strike out supernatural. Firstly, we can strike out ancient because while it is long developed, it still persists. Ancient doesn't work as an adjective for something which is still alive and for which people still fight. Similarly, supernatural, I don't think I've described anything today that sits outside of nature. All of it is intranatural. The water is nature. The mountain is nature. The sun is nature. So the idea that it's super or supernatural or what we might call a metaphysic uh, just plainly isn't true. This isn't the super imposition of a moral order over nature. Rather, it is nature and our interactions with it which create the belief and the tikanga and the manakitanga and the way of being and protecting. Perhaps only in comparison, um, animism can be hard to understand. Animism sounds like animal. And it's been difficult to discuss the concept for a long time up until today because it, it suffers from an external hierarchical gaze. People think that anim animism is naive and ancient and outdated and has no use. The reason for this is its difference from other forms of knowledge, epistemology, <clears throat> ontology, which is the being of things in the world, just objects, ontology. And any sense of authority taken from the divine. If you look at the diagram on the left, this is a very crude model of the monotheistic worldview, which is not to mean the religious worldview, but the worldview which has emerged from areas and peoples who have in their past had their knowledge systems developed under, generally speaking, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the great universalizing religions of the world. Uh, this gives us at the top a, a kind of a number one man who's an absolute authority and cause for everything that happens in the world. Uh, everything has a cause, but it's only from one source. After that, we have man who's invested with agency. Um, almost everywhere in the Western world, we have an individualistic society where each person is to their own, has their own viewpoint and develops a subjectivity. Uh, this seems natural and it is within those cultures in that system. As you move away from the single divine being to man, you kind of get to the rest of the world and we can see the diminishing value in agency and consciousness. There was one single point of consciousness then there was man who was also conscious though not as much. And as we continue down, we get to the natural, natural world being the mountains and the rivers and the trees. And in there, we find a less of an idea that they might also be alive. 
I also be conscious and I also have an agency. On the right, we have the traditions of other cultures uh, which haven't developed for a, for a long time within that monotheistic. So we have a polytheistic model of understanding. Um, this means, broadly speaking, many gods, like we talked about before, uh, kami, yokai, they can't really be, it's not useful to distinguish between them, same with iwiatua. It's a much more distribution of divinity throughout the world, not from a single source and not from a single cause. As that authority, consciousness, and agency is spread out through the world, in the air, in the water, in the land, amongst peoples, I may also going to take a sip. It lessens the idea of a singular cause and effect. I put a circle around this to represent that feedback loop between peoples and nature. Um, it's an odd point to talk about, but I just took a sip of water. Rene Descartes, <laughs> the Western philosopher, will tell us, uh, cogito ego sum, I think, therefore I am. Under the Christian monotheistic view, even though Descartes was a modernizer within that field, um, your living, your being is dependent on consciousness. And that's your separation from the world. This is how I exist. I am here. Here is the world. On the other side, in our animist cultures, I took a sip with water of water because I can't live without it. If anyone thinks that human consciousness has no relationship to water, try not drinking any for seven days. And then I'll ask you <laughs> how your cognitive functions are going. This goes for everything else as well. Um, Anyone who's ever had the trouble of an iron deficiency, how funny that you should need metals in your body. Not really. You need the earth inside of you at all times. In a very real sense, from the way that the human body works, you're never a fixed unit at all. You're always breathing, always taking in air. It's always being transmuted into oxygen, taken into your blood cells. You can't ever be outside of nature. It's not possible. I chose a very heavy note to end up. <laughs> um, I must apologize for moving away from the yokai as a subject. Hopefully that made sense. You can see how the yokai are that expression of this relationship. And looking at the relationship itself, we can see how cultures of Maori and the Japanese can meet each other in that middle point. It's my belief that it's most likely other Pacific nations could do the exact same thing. I've got no doubt about that. As strong as the linguistic link is, uh, I, I will guarantee you that we will find a circle and that distribution in the epistemological history of those peoples. And I'll stop there for any questions. Thanks. <laughs>